I am very excited to announce that today we are releasing a new study from AEI and the National Opinion Research Center on birth mothers who place their children for adoption through Spence Chapin services to families and children. Uh, when we began talking about this study in 2019, we actually had no idea how much more intense the conversations around infant adoption would become in the years that have followed. Uh, in the wake of the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision last year, there has been a spate of media describing how private infant adoption is a traumatic event for everyone involved. Um, adult adoptees in the media have recounted the crises of identity that they have often faced in life, even comparing the practice to colonization and slavery. Um, but others actually have expressed concerns about the coercion that they believe birth mothers experience and might experience more if abortion were to be restricted further. Uh, recent revelations about Franco-era stolen babies, for instance, have spurred comparisons with post-Roe America today. Uh, as one writer wrote in September, babies taken from poor or unwed mothers and being handed off to supposedly more deserving families, often by religious institutions, is a hallmark of religious anti-abortion regimes. You see how this might be relevant today, unquote. So is it relevant? What is the experience of birth mothers in the US today? Between 10,000 and 20,000 children are adopted through private agencies in the US each year. This is distinct from adoption out of the foster care system, which is done only after a parent's rights have been terminated due to abuse, neglect, or abandonment. And while there have been more attention devoted recently to understanding private infant adoption and what's known as the triad, which is adoptive children, adoptive parents, and birth parents, this field needs a lot more attention. So in 2019, uh, we were approached with a unique opportunity to look at data from Spence Chapin, which is the oldest adoption agency in New York. There was so much that we wanted to know, but we decided to start with a study of birth mothers and learn more about their demographics and their experiences. We were able to look at the outcomes for hundreds of women who placed their children for adoption between 2006 and 2020. Nork researchers examined over 700 de-identified administrative records, surveyed 60 birth mothers, and conducted a number of in-depth interviews to get a sense of who these women were and how their lives unfolded after the placement. So this morning, we're going to be having two panels. The first is a panel to dig into the details of the study and get a sense of what we can and can't learn from this particular study. The second is going to be a discussion of the cultural and political implications of these findings uh, and adoption more generally. So without further ado, let me in introduce our panel. Um, they have, they're all at various, various level of sickness today, sadly. Um, Kate Trumbulskaya is the CEO of Spence Chapin. She's actually joining us virtually today. Prior to working at Spence Chapin, Kate was senior attorney for the City of New York's Administration for Children's Services. Michael Lopez, here to my right, is vice president in the Education and De Child Development Department at NORC. Prior to working at NORC, he co-led the National Research Center on Hispanic Children and Families. And Brandon Coffey Borden, all the way on the end there, is a senior research scientist at NORC. Prior to joining NORC, he was a managing associate with Community Science, where he provided research evaluation and capacity building services. So first this morning, I want to turn to Kate for a discussion of what Spence Chapin is and the process by which the women in this study came to place their children for adoption. So Kate, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you're feeling OK. And, and why don't you start us off by telling us a little bit about Spence Chapin um, and, the, and the mothers that you're serving. Thank you so much, Naomi. Um, Spence Chapin Services for Families and Children has been in existence for over a century. Uh, serving and creating more than 30,000 families internationally and domestically. Um, it's been founded that children who are abandoned in New York um, really deserve to be a good family. Um, in terms of the birth mothers that we're serving, Spence Chapin serves birth mothers who are experiencing pregnancies and comes to Spence Chapin to receive comprehensive options counseling services. Um, and I wanna highlight the core of the services that Spence Chapin offers. It's really a model that, has, that is driven by birth parents 
Yes. Hold on, uh, Kate, oh. Kate, I just want to stop you for a second. We're, we're dropping out about every fifth word or so, so I just want to make sure that everything is fine because I, I think we're having some trouble hearing. Just give us a second. Sure. All right, keep going, Kate, sorry. Um, so to answer your question, Spence's history really dates back to hundreds of years ago, and the focus has always been on making sure that the births are treated and supported in the same or similar fashion as adoptive families. And so there are core service offerings that make Spence cheap and really uh, a unique institution in that way. And that is seen through our non-existent disruption and dissolution rates. Um, so in terms of the birth parents who come to Spence Chapin, they come from different walks of life. Um, and they come to us, they're experiencing a crisis, mostly referred to us by and healthcare providers. But there are different referral sources as we will get into the research piece um, and my highlight is specifically top sources for Spence Chapin. So, um, I'm sorry, is there? Okay, so maybe we should try to go to other panelists and then see sure. if maybe Kate can sure. um, do something about her connection. Would that be good? Okay, all right. Um, so, uh, all right. So, so just to reiterate, because some of what Kate was say, saying was kind of dropped out. Um, uh, Spence Chapin is over 100 years old. Um, they offer options counseling, so women who come to them um, can be counseled uh, for abortion, they can be counseled for adoption, or they can be counseled for parenting. Um, and Spence Chapin lays out all these options in a very transparent way. Um, women who decide that they want to work with Spence Chapin um, can actually go all the way through this process to giving birth and then something called interim care, which we'll discuss a little bit more afterwards. But interim care basically uh, offers women the chance to decide about whether they want a place for adoption or whether they want a parent um, for a few weeks after they've given birth. That, that woman can decide to place that baby uh, with a background checked, uh, certified Spence Chapin volunteer for a few weeks while they make their final decision about adoption. So I just want to put that out there. That's sort of what uh, Spence Chapin also provides um, uh, representation, legal representation, and sort of social work representation to both birth families and adoptive families. And those are separate representations. Um, so that's sort of a, a little bit of the model of what Spence Chapin has provided. I want to just uh, kind of go, before we get back to Kate, and we're going to kind of work on the connection a little bit, um, to Mike to just talk a little bit about, um, you know, you and I met in 2019. There was like sort of an enormous amount of data that we could have dug into. Um, you know, what is what was the model for this study, and and you know how how was it created, and and what do you think that um, I mean. I have sort of thoughts about why we went in this direction, but you know, you have a lot of background in this area. Um, what did you think in terms of the, this was the most productive way of kind of directing our attention? Um, no, great, great questions. And um, I, I first want to thank Naomi and, and her AI colleagues, as well as Spence Chapin and, and all of their colleagues and our, and our colleagues from Rutgers University who also partnered with us on, on this. Um, this was a, a, a challenge, definitely a challenge. Um, when you first, when you all first came and said, "Hey, Spence Chapin is really interested in taking this look inward to see their open adoption model and what they can learn from it, what they can learn around the characteristics of the of the birth mothers who've been served, uh, those who place and don't place, um, as well as trying to understand how they can continue to look at their services and and." kind of a, a continuous quality improvement. How can they improve their services? So uh, I commend them for taking that, that inward look. It was definitely a challenge when uh, looking at, OK, so we have data from 2006 to 2020. Well, 2019 at the time, since added some more data. Um, what can we do with that data? And so we tried to look at a lot of, a lot of uh, 
you know, trying to maximize what we can, what we can use, do with the data that, that they did have, um, and then what additional data could we collect. And so we designed it around four main, um, four main aims for the study. The first being, and you kind of touched on this, is what are the demographic characteristics of the um, Spence Shapen birth mothers served since 2006, and then the demographics of the, the comparison of the birth mothers and birth fathers, to a degree, who place their child for adoption but, uh, versus those who choose to parent. Um, and then the third one being, for those who, who, who do choose uh, adoption, the experiences with Spence Chapin services and the adoption, uh, the counseling, the, the adoptive placement process, and the contact and relationship quality with the um, adopted child. And then finally, the last aim being, what are, the, what are their, the birth mother's perceived impacts of adoption on their own well-being and self-sufficiency? So those were the four main aims of the study. And you, you touched on it um, in terms of what data did we use. And so, of course, naturally they had um, the administrative records, and we were able to go back and work with Sven Chapin to try and identify the, as much of the administrative records, and there's, some has since been computerized, some of the older, older data records were um, um, archived in boxes, and we had to kind of dig them out. And so, <clears throat> um, really trying to pull out as much information that they had on the universe of, of birth mothers who had been served by Spence Chapin over that time period. And I think um, we ended up with 702 different cases of, of data, which is a, a good solid universe. But, there, but of these three different sources of data, and, and Brandon will talk a little bit more about this in terms of what some of the findings are, it's, it's important to contextualize. There's the administrative data that's the biggest universe. Uh, but then there was an online survey that we developed in partnership with Spence Chapin and, and you all to try and really get at seven different areas. Um, of course, some additional information on their demographic and, and um, uh, participant characteristics, some on working with Spence Chapin more than what we had from the uh, basic administrative data, their perceptions of the services, their interactions with social workers and specific service types, and their perceptions for, of, of open adoption. Then um, also what motivates them to not um, have an open adoption or to choose a, a, an adoption. And then their reflections on their post-adoption lives after, afterwards. And then finally, some input on um, their reflections or suggestions for Spence Chapin services. Because again, part of this was Spence Chapin was really interested in looking at um, how they can continue to improve their services and how they can learn from this information. So we ended up with, of the, we had the 702 to start with, we ended up with the online survey. Spence Chapin um, reached out to those that they had the contact information on, and we ended up um, well, with a 294 um, birth mothers, and then we ended up with a final group of 53 who were able to complete the surveys. And then the final source of information came from a smaller group of in-depth interviews with birth mothers who had completed the surveys. And the idea was to ex expand on some of the different areas um, in terms of their life circumstances during the pregnancy, the experiences with the services, um, ideas for improvement, and um, the current life circumstances or, or, and, and the impact of the adoption. So a chance to get a little more qualitative information than what we can get from the survey. Um, and so that, those three, were those, those were the three different levels of information that we were able to collect from, from the birth mothers. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to see if, are we, we anywhere with Kate? Are we? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Kate, I just want to test it out and see whether, whether we can hear you any better now. Um, I was going to ask you if you could just describe a little bit more about what Spence Chapin, uh, the relationship that Spence Chapin has with these mothers, um, what kinds of services you're offering them, and you know the fact that you had this kind of long-term relationship with them such that we could still contact people who placed in 2006, um, I think might surprise some people. So if you could just maybe start to describe a little bit that and we'll, we'll, hear, we'll see if we can hear you better. Sure, um, thank you for that. Can you hear me better? I think so, keep yeah. talking. It's usually every sixth or seventh word that we're missing. Okay. Well, well, let me just start off by ex explaining the Spence Chapin way, which is the model that we use today at 
really is some of the things you've touched upon, Naomi, but it's really made up of five critical elements. The first one, as you described, is the options counseling piece. And it's also working specifically with a birth, birth parent social worker. So our departments between birth parent and adoptive parents are separate. And that's really critical to receiving comprehensive ongoing options counseling, where birth parent feels that they're supported and someone is there in their corner from the beginning to the end of the process and for the journey of adoption, because it's not a moment in time, it's a continuum of services. Um, and that really ties into the point that you raised in terms of the relationship, the ongoing relationship with the birth mothers. The second critical element of the Spence Chapin way is the interim care piece that you referenced. It's, it's a time and space for a birth parent to really contemplate their options while a child is being cared for by one of our providers. Um, that really speaks to um, the holistic approach that we undertake to really engage the birth parents on exploring their options. I would say that many birth parents use our interim care services and while doing so, they have clarity around what decision they wanna make for their child. Um, in fact, around 65% or so of birth parents who utilize our services um, choose to parent after interim care. Um, the third element I would say of the Spence Chapin way is access to independent legal counsel. And we see this in the research findings that information, um, good information, support, no, being um, um, supported by an independent attorney outside of Spence Chapin really formed that fundamental rights piece for a lot of birth parents. And in their reflections, they thought how critical it was for them to have an outside legal counsel discuss all their options in terms of relinquishment and what the legal process will entail. So that separation between legal representation from an expert counsel in Spence Chapin is also very critical. The fourth piece, which I think the fourth element is the choosing matching process and open adoption. Birth parents have an opportunity not only to choose the adoptive family, but also to meet the adoptive family and form a relationship. That's the core of our open adoption practice. Uh, instead of kind of throwing in an agreement together where they've never met, we strive and aim to develop that relationship really early on. So both the adoptive parents and birth parents feel that they are at the driver's seat, really deciding what's in the best interest for their child long term. Uh, and I think these are really, um, you know, four, I would say, pre placement elements or pre-adoption elements. And then of course, the fifth one is the ongoing post-adoption support and services. Um, birth parents come to us years after placement, seeking counseling, seeking support groups, seeking a community. And that's also core to the Spence Chapin way. Great, thank you, Kate. You sound much better. We're glad the connection Great. working. Um, thank right. God. Thank Brandon, thank you for your patience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I wanted to talk to you, Brandon, about the kind of the specific findings of the survey. Um, I want to start with the demographics. Um, you know, what, what we know about these women, I think there is a lot of kind of misperceptions about who is a birth mother placing for adoption, partly because we hear stories from other countries or we think about adoption as the way it looked in the 1950s. So, so tell us about these mothers, what we know from that first set of administrative data uh, that Michael was referencing. Sure, so uh, when we consider the administrative data in our analysis, and I, I think to, um, to Mike's point earlier that uh, this administrative data sample was a very specific sample. Um, so it did not necessarily represent all birth mothers who had been served by Spence Chapin, uh, but provided a, a subsample uh, between 2006 and uh, 2020. And one of the things that we found is uh, a uh, most identified as, uh, as white, um, or the greatest proportion identified as white, followed by black uh, and then Hispanic. Uh, we found in terms of average age, um, birth mothers were around, uh, you know, relatively in their late 20s. Uh, we found that about two-thirds of birth mothers have been born in, in the United States. Uh, most birth mothers identified their primary language as, as English. 
Uh, and then we also, uh, in the administrative, in administrative data, we're able to explore uh, other kinds of experiences, understanding uh, experiences with interim care, um, as well as uh, experiences around uh, birth um, and experiences around post uh, uh, contact, uh, post adoption contact agreements, uh, agreements as well. So, um, you, so we you mentioned language and age, and about twenty seven was about the average age um, mm -hmm. of a birth mother. Um, can you also describe a little bit about their um, their economic situation, sure. their education, mm -hmm. and uh, you know whether they were working and what mm -hmm. you know what kind of income bracket they were in? Sure. So. Uh, in most birth mothers um, were, uh, in terms of uh, relationship status, they were, uh, they were single. Um, they uh, most had uh, not earned a, a bachelor's degree. Uh, we found that uh, most, uh, about 79% were also not enrolled in school. Uh, in terms of, of income, uh, they tended to be uh, moderate to, to low income uh, in terms of what we were able to find in um, our survey data. Uh, and we also found that uh, they were about equally likely to say that a grandmother um, or another family member was aware um, of their preg pregnancy as uh, was unaware uh, of their pregnancy as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, and, and so it's interesting, so that was in the administrative data. Correct. The, mm -hmm. so, so Spence, so Kate, I just wanted sort of to get into that a little bit. So, so when Spence Chapin is, is doing an intake, you know, is, is sort of meeting this person for the first time, um, can you talk about kind of this data that you're trying to collect and what you're trying to find out? When you ask a birth mother, like, is somebody else aware in your family of, uh, of this pregnancy? Is the father involved? Who is the father? In you know, what, what are you trying to elicit there? Why does Spence Chapin collect that information? That's a great question, Naomi. I think there are, well, you know, multiple reasons. The first one, I think a big one is engaging the birth mother and getting all the history uh, regarding situation in order to properly offer options counseling and explore all the options. We need to understand her family dynamic. Uh, we also need to, um, you know, undergo the legal process. You know, the New York law requires certain things to happen if, in fact, a birth father is involved in the process. Um, getting the support system in place for birth parents. A lot of times, birth parents coming with their mother or their aunt to make this decision to move forward with adoption or not and have proper supports in place is really critical for us. And the third reason is collecting the data so we can look back and, and think about, you know, what's, what's the quality improvement here? How do we improve and enhance our services and experiences for birth parents? What's important for us? How do we move forward in serving our clients better in New York? And, you know, this kind of data led to uh, our internal changes where we are now offering our services in various communities throughout New York City and New Jersey, um, where we are uh, offering options counseling and satellite offices where our social workers are physically present in some of these vulnerable communities where birth parents can access these services. So this demographic information is really critical for us to be better at what we do, um, to really meet the legal requirements to assess the needs of the birth parents and to enhance our own services. Did, were you surprised, and maybe I'll ask you this question too, Michael. Um, I mean, I was actually quite taken aback by the average age um, in the administrative data. I thought, I thought it, was, it was higher than I expected it to be. Um, and you know, you have a lot of kind of early childhood experience. I was wondering if, you know, if that's something that surprised you or whether there were other, um, and, and Kate, you can answer this too, the other findings, uh, demographically speaking, before we move on to kind of the survey that surprised you in terms of who was involved in placing their children. Well, I, I, I think that it does go um, against some of what you see in other, in, in other data, and, and, but that is also an important footnote to, to note that while the administrative data, the 700, 702, I think, that we had, um, represents a big chunk, it's not the, the totality of the universe. Mm -hmm. It also doesn't represent all, a, a, I mean, a, I think this overall study is important to contextualize it, that it captures the Spence Chapin uh, you know, open adoption process to the agency and the data that they have there, not necessarily complete, totally complete, but it really gives a good glimpse. But it was still surprising that the age and some of the demographics and, you know, I think that uh, Brendan mentioned two-thirds were, were born in the U.S. and those that were foreign-born, I think it was a small number, but um, 
uh, the next highest number were from China was 6%, Central America, and then Mexico. So it kind of goes against some of what you see from other data sources. Mm -hmm. So it was a little surprising that it's not your typical, what you, what you often hear about in terms of teen pregnancy. And um, um, so mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that was a little bit surprising. Kate, what about you? I mean, obviously you have this experience. What were there, in terms of the demographics, what jumped out at you? I think for me, what jumped out is the um, no, uh, ex no, no reported substance abuse. I think that was a main standout for me that really those numbers were quite low. In our experience, we do see a lot of uh, birth mothers who are coming to us, especially now with unintended pregnancies where there is significant substance abuse exposure. And so that was a piece of data to see. So uh, I would you're say saying that they were, that in the survey, that, that you think they weren't reporting what was, what was actually true, or you're saying that, that maybe previously there was less of that in, from the early years? I, I think maybe it was less of that um, than it is what we're seeing today. Um, it could be a combination of both. Mm -hmm. um, again, that was a, a thing that stood out for me the most, that what we're seeing today, I would say 75% of the birth mothers who are seeking services have uh, you know, some element of substance abuse. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wanted to just move on to the questions that we asked in the survey about their experiences. And these are questions that were both related to um, their kind of general life experience after placement and also questions that were related to um, kind of their particular experience with Spence Chapin in terms of the adoption process. And then finally, you know, questions about, you know, their ongoing relationship with uh, the child and the adoptive family. So, Brandon, I was wondering if you could kind of give us a little bit of a tour sure. through that part of the data. Absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so when we think about the, the services that uh, Kate noted earlier, um, options counseling, uh, legal services and the like, one of the things that came through very strongly in the survey was a uh, high level of satisfaction uh, with those services um, on the part of the, the birth mothers. Um, I think uh, you know, it, that was particularly true for uh, interim care. Um, in which uh, birth mothers appreciated that, that opportunity to utilize those services um, as they were making decisions uh, about how to, to move forward. Uh, I do, another thing I would say is that um, you know, they, they also noted the incredibly critical role uh, that Spence Chapin's social worker played um, in supporting them through this process uh, and making sure that their, their needs uh, were met. And I think that's something that, that came out both in the survey uh, as well as the, the interviews we conducted. Um, and, and I think those are probably the two core uh, core findings, uh, I think, from the, the survey data, really, is, is the high level of satisfaction with services. Uh, and then I guess I would finally say that, uh, in general, in terms of life satisfaction, uh, we find relatively high levels of life satisfaction among the birth mothers who, who complete the survey as well. I would say those are the, the key findings. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, so, so in terms of the, the categories that we asked about um, in terms of life satisfaction, we asked about their um, physical safety, romantic mm -hmm. relationships, um, their career. Um, what, you know, what, I don't know, maybe Michael, you want to answer this, like, how, you know, in terms of picking those categories, um, what were we, what, what is the survey trying to get at there? And um, again, I'll sort of get back to this question of, um, did you find any of this surprising? Again, with the, you know, obviously with the caveats that this is a self-selecting group with the survey, people who decided to complete it. Um, did you expect to see such high levels of life satisfaction? Or did you expect that, you know, maybe adoption, the adoption process, you know, whatever its, um, you know, its benefits at the time uh, was going to sort of signal a life that was starting to go off course in some ways? Well, that's a good question. And I think, again, you know, um, retrospective recall is always challenging given this time period, such a long time period. Um, and then the self-selection of who responded, who didn't respond. So you would a anticipate that those who responded probably had more positive experiences. Um, but still, there was still some, a lot of, um, I think a lot more positive responses in terms of how they viewed the adoption process, and the services, but also then their outcomes and how it really has, um, they have um, had more positive outcomes in terms of their own experiences in, in life, in terms of personal experiences and in their career um, opportunities. 
Um, Kate, so when you, when you saw these results, I mean, again, with the caveat that this is a self-selecting group, um, were there things that you, that surprised you, things that you thought, you know, Spence Chapin needs to work on um, from, from the results of the survey and maybe even the interview? Um, it did seem like, you know, people were happy with the options counseling and the social worker experience, and, and that social worker experience seemed to last a very long time. I mean, um, you know, the fact that, you know, many of these people people maintain contact and described how they main con maintain contact for years afterwards. Um, can you talk about, you know, what, what you thought of, you know, hearing the experiences of these women? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So as everyone mentioned, counseling services were vital for them. And we heard this over and over again in all data pieces that were collected. They repeatedly mentioned the importance of their relationship with their social worker. Um, in reflecting on their experiences and noted that these relationships were really a key component of their satisfaction with their adoption experience. I think the second big takeaway was, you know, with an average of seven years since placement occurred, feedback from birth mothers expressing satisfaction with their openness arrangements provides, provided us, what me, with critical insight into the sustainability and the success of open adoption. Um, you know, another big key takeaway that I'm sure um, surprised or I'm assuming surprised many was the birth mothers reported negative treatment by hospital staff at their birthing hospital, adding significant stress to their adoption planning um, process. Well, um, you know, for me, this wasn't surprising as we hear this all the time. Um, I think it was um, surprising to see the extent of this experience reported. Um, though, Naomi, I know that we both discussed, you know, the recent, recent research by the OPT Institute that looked at the major groups that influenced uh, birth parents experiencing unplanned pregnancies. And the second top group that really um, influenced birth mothers was healthcare providers and medical professionals. So while it's overwhelming, it's, it's definitely not surprising. Um, I think that for things that we, we can learn and what we heard that was surprising is the um, desire of birth parents to seek um, a more meaningful relationship with the adoptive parents and not just the child. So that's something that was a really big takeaway for us um, to really create a platform for ongoing contact, not only with the child, but really to build on that relationship with the adoptive families. Yeah, that, that the adoptive families were not just kind of a vehicle for <coughs> necessarily having that contact with the child, but also giving them a sense that, you know, that they had made the right decision and that they had some insight into how this child was being raised. Um, I just wanted to dig into this because I think, again, there are a lot of misperceptions about what what open adoption looks like. Um, the the post-adoption agreements that you are, you know, kind of uh, help these families to form, um, they're not legal, they, they're not legally binding. I mean, you can't, you, you can't, is that correct? I mean, you can't force, even if you say ahead of time, you know, I, you promise to send me, you know, two letters a, a month or something like that about how this child is being raised, is that, that's not legally binding? Well, the birth parents, New York happens to be a jurisdiction that recognizes legally enforceable post-adoption contact agreements and non-enforceable post-adoption contact agreements. The birth parents really are the ones who choose whether or not they wish to have an enforceable PACA, one that can be enforced in a court of law. In our experience, we've never been to court enforcing these agreements, but we do see an uptake of birth parents choosing enforceable PACA agreements. Mm -hmm. And that's really tied to also the legal independent representation. The attorneys that they're speaking to are seeing a trend in New York of selecting enforceable PACA agreements. It's an extra layer of, you know, supporting and protecting their rights in terms of ongoing contact. Um, the, the actual experience is that, you know, whenever there is a sit down during the matching process, the birth parents the birth mother and the adoptive family really come to terms on what makes sense in that individual case. Um, it's never something that's set in stone, um, you know, 
concretely for each family as we move forward. It's something that's individual to that situation. Um, we've seen open adoption be as um, as frequent as you know every other month, and that's a comfort level that birth parents and adoptive families um, reach. We see open adoption as you know just exchange of letters once a year, or meeting for um, you know specific holidays or milestones, etc. So there's no um, one formula for um, you know enforceable PACAs or non-enforceable PACAs. Mm -hmm. I think in this, um, with this particular data, we did see more non-enforceable post-adoption contact agreements mm -hmm. being chosen. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, again, not the trend today. Um, so, Michael, I mean, I, again, want to sort of get some kind of context here. So Spence Chapin is one adoption agency in the country. Um, in some ways, uh, you know, they're a little bit atypical. I mean, specifically with the, the issue of interim care. Um, you know, this is a model, I confess, I was kind of skeptical of this idea that, you know, you're going to place a baby with a stranger for a month, um, you know, or even a week, uh, you know, right after birth. Even, by the way, the, you know, the, the birth mother can have contact with that child whenever they want. Um, but just the idea that that separation occurs right then. Um, what do you think kind of the, the interim care model kind of allowed us to look at in terms of the survey? And, um, you know, and, and what does it tell us, like, when we're thinking about this more broadly for the way other adoption agencies operate, um, you know, uh, is this a model from the survey that seemed to work? And, and, and how did it sort of also aid the survey? A lot of questions there. Sorry. Um, I, I, I'm intrigued by the interim care model. Um, and uh, I think that, like you, I, it, it, more questions were raised than were answered. Um, I think it answered some really interesting questions. I think it also raised some questions as to, I want to get under the hood more, like any good self-respecting researcher. I want more data, more data, more data. Um, I want more complete data, and I, and I commend um, Spence Chapin um, for being as open and to, to critically look at this. You know, they're very, they have a very strong model. Um, they feel very strong about their approach, and I, and I and I think there's a lot that suggests, you know, some some of these from what we've seen, some of these positive experiences. But I would want to know more. I want um, to to try it out a little more, see, get more complete data um, from, you know, a larger survey or or the, their ongoing data collection. I think it has a lot of merit, a lot of promise to to kind of explore further to see is that model in and of itself, or are there variations in in that interim care services? To, to really explore that and like, what is it about that to unpack it further? Um, so it's definitely worth, worth um, exploring further. I do think that, and you, and you brought up a really important point, that this is one look at one adoption agency. And um, it, it would be great to look at others to see like, how does this compare? And we, you know, we start off, we didn't intend to compare this, this compared to other, and that was, that was clear from the beginning. Um, but it is, it would be interesting to see if you looked at other adoption or, um, agencies to see how this interim care services component as well as the additional uh, services that they provide, what is, the, what is the secret sauce, what is the set of ingredients that really make the biggest difference. Right. But we were able to look at people who went through the interim care process and then decided whether or whether they wanted to parent or wanted to place for adoption. And I, Brandon, I was wondering if you could kind of like compare a little bit of those two groups uh, for us. Like, I mean, again, you know, this is a, it's a small sample, um, but, you know, trying to figure out, you know, whether, uh, you know, there were certain stronger associations or correlations um, with the decision to place for adoption or the decision to parent. You know, I think to start, I would say that by and large, we found that the two groups were relatively similar. But there were a few points. Uh, we did some statistical tests to try to assess the difference between uh, the two groups, um, what we called a, the placement group, which is the, the group that ultimately, a birth mother that ultimately decided to place, and a non-placement group, the, the group of, of, uh, that ultimately decided to not place. And there were a few, few statistically significant differences there, uh, one being uh, whether the child's, uh, there's an association regarding whether the child's maternal grandmother uh, was aware of the pregnancy, a uh, difference between the groups there, uh, difference in the type of delivery. What, what was, which one was more likely? 
Uh, so we did, we did not look at direction in these tests, just to see if there was association. Uh, and I think to, to Mike's point, in terms of thinking about future research, that would be a next step for future research to really begin to dig in to think about what direction we see those differences in. But this is just where there's association between the two variables. Um, uh, the number of counseling sessions, uh, whether the child's maternal grandmother was aware of the pregnancy, as I noted, number of children living in foster care, and then the number of children living elsewhere. So we saw some statistically significant differences uh, there uh, between the groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, Kate, you mentioned this question about um, you know, how uh, the women describe that sometimes they were not treated well or that their decisions uh, about adoption were not um, you know, sort of given a lot of respect by hospital workers. I don't know if, I'm, if, if you guys think I'm sort of characterizing that appropriately. Um, but you know, in terms of thinking about kind of larger policy issues here, I mean, obviously this is... Um, you know, the results of this survey can help guide your agency and maybe others in terms of, you know, some of your internal policies. But thinking about kind of the, the larger landscape here of, uh, you know, of, of how, we can, how we should be talking about adoption, who needs a little bit more education. Um, I was wondering if you can kind of talk about that. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, Kate also has experience working in kind of the public adoption and foster care world. And so maybe we could talk a little bit about that interaction afterwards too. But, but to start with kind of what, are, what do you think are the kind of the broad implications of this research um, outside of Spence Chapin? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, we're, again, we're not surprised to see the negative treatment by hospital staff. Um, being that they're our top world source, um, having adoption competency training for healthcare professional curriculum and educating social workers, labor and services is something that we strive to do today in a smaller context. But definitely having a policy uh, around educating the healthcare community. Um, I can't tell you how many times we've um, been before a hospital, did a presentation, thought that this was great, and you know, adoption was discussed thoroughly. Um, we follow up with some very concrete examples, and we're back at it a month later because there's been such a turnover in the healthcare system that there's really no consistency and no requirement as as an onboarding training even for healthcare community, uh, uh, you know, in in with respect to adoption and. What, what is the you specific know, feedback that these women are getting? Like, what do the hospital workers or medical staff say to them um, that make them feel uncomfortable about their decision or that suggests that they don't really understand the decision? Yeah, I mean, what we hear a lot is um, there's just a lot of shame and guilt uh, in, in even pursuing adoption. Um, things like, don't you want a parent? You can do it with your family. Um, choose foster care instead because it's a temporary solution. You can always do better. Um, there's a chance for you to rehabilitate. Adoption is a finality. Um, so we hear a lot of these anecdotal, um, you know, kind of things from birth parents who come back and say, you know, I'm, I'm experiencing something very different here with you. I'm really diving into what I really can and cannot do today as, as a parent. Um, and so there is a lot of that, you know, personal bias that gets um, transferred onto the birth parents who had just given birth and are inquiring about their options. So the fact that adoption is not contemplated as a viable option and healthcare providers would rather call child protective services and place that child into foster care, it, you know, it's, it's quite alarming. I, I was going to ask about that question because I think one of the you know one of the issues that we did ask about is whether uh, the the parent uh, the had previous children who had who were in foster care, um, and it was a, you know kind of a very small sample, so hard to tell. Um, but you know there are definitely instances where you have uh, you know someone who is working for the public foster care system, and they've seen a, you know a parent whose child you know or more than one child has already been removed and that woman is is pregnant again you know what what should our education for those social workers be like in terms of infant adoption is there is there a place for that or is that just sort of too coercive 
um, you know, for the state to even suggest that as an option, even if those children have already, you know, even if other children in that family have already been removed due to abuse or severe neglect? I mean, I think it's, a, you know, child welfare reform is complex, um, as we know. And I think that child protective specialists, and I'm, I'm going to speak exclusively about New York jurisdiction, are absolutely not trained around adoption competency. In fact, it is discouraged by the local social service district like ACS to discuss adoption as a viable outcome and option. Uh, return to parent, reunification, family preservation are the top priorities for ACS and for child protective specialists. And that's because of really related to funding. Um, you know, the federal government Title IV-E um, really uh, ties outcomes related to reunification to funding. So there's really no room to offer adoption as a viable option for women, even Knowing that there was a child placed in foster care and a second child was born, there's no discussion around that. It's it's not something that's offered or encouraged. Mm. Um, and I, I do think that's a bigger, you know, policy change that um, would really shape the way we think about uh, the well-being of children and prioritizing child welfare instead of um, family reunification, which is what is trending today within the child welfare system. Um, I, so I should I should have said at the beginning we're going to be putting up the whole report on AEI's website so you can access it there AEI.org, um, and we're going to actually be turning it over to audio, audience questions in a few minutes so please prepare your questions, um, and but I wanted to before we did that um, one of the things that came up in the interviews that I wanted to ask about um, you know these women are getting to choose and meet the birth families um, bef the b the adoptive families before they decide to place. And one of the themes that came up in these interviews is that Spence Chapin, you know, is serving a wide variety of adoptive families. There are families of different races, of different religious backgrounds. Uh, there are same-sex couples. And, and a, a number of the women sort of described, the birth mothers described appreciating that. And I was wondering, Brandon, if you could talk a little bit about kind of what came up in those interviews. And, you know, this is not, you know, in, in this way, Spence Chapin is not so typical. I mean, a lot of adoption agencies do sort of serve one demographic or another. So maybe this is a way in which this is unique. But Brandon? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that uh, came through uh, in those uh, nine in-depth interviews, um, I think uh, to what we discussed earlier in terms of the satisfaction with the services, part of that certainly was um, the extent to which Spence Chapin's staff, well, to the extent uh, birth mothers felt that Spence Chapin's staff uh, respected them uh, in terms of their um, their uh, background, their race, their ethnicity, their cultural background, linguistic background. Uh, and were responsive uh, to those needs. Uh, so I think that really was a critical component in terms of thinking about the broader satisfaction with the, the services received. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michael, did you, I don't know if you want to add anything on that. No, no, no I, I, I think that that was, that was definitely a, a positive thing that came out. And I, I would love to see more of that um, uh, because it kind of builds on the services and the responsiveness of Spence Chapin services overall but in particular around placement. So speaking of things you'd like to see more of, so I, I wanted to just ask about kind of, the, you know, the future of this research. Like, we, you know, we started with one part of this triad, really. We started with the birth mothers. But I mean, I think there's so much more we could be thinking about in terms of birth mothers, too. Um, what, uh, you know, what would you like to see as kind of the next steps of this research? What kind of most, most interested you kind of going forward? What are, what are, we, what are we missing? Well, we, we didn't really touch much on the father data. And you know, one of the things, it's always a challenge, not, not unique to this study, but it's always a challenge to get um, father data. And um, the data on fathers was reported by the mothers. And so it's hard to get that information typically. Um, naturally, I'd, I'd, I would love to see more complete data. Um, goes without saying. And I think that you know, the, in, in working with, with Spence Chapin and staff on figuring out their administrative data and how much they can t take from somebody, even the survey, as an ongoing, um, on an ongoing basis, to collect more of that on a regular, you know, on a, on a regular basis, to really have that self-reflection, to really see that the the uh, both in a positive way and, and in a self-critical way, in terms of how can they continue to improve their services. Um, I think again, the the father data, really getting more information on the fathers, 
Um, I, it's, it's, it's that kind of information. This was a, a moment in time and a glimpse, but to get more complete data, and then of course, imagine doing on, with, another, with another adoption agency, right. um, because it was hard to kind of capture all this in one single effort. Um, and so there are limitations, you know, with, with the number of surveys and the number of interviews, but I think it really kind of opened up a door for exploring some of these different aspects of the Spence Chapin model, and um, love to go even further on that. Yeah, I mean, we should talk about, Kate, you know, the challenges for you just in collecting this data from these women at this very vulnerable point in their lives. Um, you know, uh, a lot of them, there's a reason that they don't want the father involved in this. Um, but, you know, can we, I don't know, maybe Brandon too, like just address some of the challenges that we faced in collecting this data, in asking women yeah. some very sensitive questions about their experiences. Right. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the things that we experienced um, as we were collecting the data was uh, a need to, to, to pivot and think about um, different ways to try to in increase uh, the response rate, for example, for the survey. Uh, you know, how we can adjust outreach uh, to encourage participation in the in-depth interviews that we talked about. Um, and I, I think that certainly I think there's some lessons that can be drawn about, uh, you know, how we um, need to be flexible and adaptive, right, given what we're seeing in terms of the data collection process. Um, and um, I, I think in terms of uh, the outreach uh, that uh, Spencer Chapin was doing, uh, two birth mothers for the survey, um, especially uh, in the adapting in terms of follow-up and the approach that was used there uh, to try to make contact with, with birth mothers. So certainly I think some, some challenges there, but also some lessons. Mm -hmm. well, and, it's also, and it's also hard to go back that far. So right. yeah. trying to go back all the way to, to, to birth mothers who had um, been served as early as 2006, given how traumatic some of those experiences were, it, it, it's just a really, it's a big challenge. Um, and so that's where thinking about it proactively going forward, mm -hmm. how to capture some of that information earlier on and on an ongoing basis maybe maybe beneficial so that it's not having to go, because there's selection bias in terms of who right. who wanted to be reached, kind right. of like you alluded to. Right. So um, we're getting a glimpse, but how representative is that? And you know, it's 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 an important look, but clearly wanting to try and get a, a, a bigger picture or a broader picture of right. the complete uh, pool of birth mothers who were who were uh, served. Uh, Kate, can you try to start talk about all these challenges? And also, if you kind of think about going forward, um, do you want to sort of do either intake or? even outreach a few months out a little bit differently in order to find out more of this information within the time frame that, you know, mothers are, you know, are able to sort of, you know, speak about it clearly. Yeah, I think that we, we when we begin the process at intake, we always ask about birth fathers. I think that what you mentioned, Naomi, it's a very sensitive time for birth parents, birth mothers, and the high percentage of unknown uh, or unresponsive information without explanation is just, it kind of permeates the process and our experience. And even now it's, it's really the same information gathering. Um, and as we go back and engage the birth mothers on options counseling, even post-placement, those converse conversations can ensue, but there's this level of discomfort um, and, just really not wanting to share the information in, in majority of these cases about birth fathers. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a delicate balance and trying to really empower and serve birth mothers in this process and, and you know, trying to um, gather this data that's really critical. Um, I think there's also um, the piece about birth fathers who are mentioned in, in the information or in the data and our responsibility in a process to engage them and to provide, provide them with notice um, if they fit the category or alternatively to terminate their parental rights. And I think that in, in those discussions, there's even more of a setback for birth mothers to want to do that. Mm -hmm. So I guess that what I'm saying is I'm not sure if from the point of intake to continuing to offer this kind of outreach or seek this kind of information, much changes would occur in, in gathering this data. Yeah. 
Well, I think that's probably a good note for us to start some questions on. I mean, this balance that you're describing, these women are on the one hand obviously at a very vulnerable point in their lives. I mean, even if they are, you know, older than we had expected and, um, you know, I think probably had a little bit more education than I personally expected and, you know, um, they, they're... Uh, it, it, the desire, to, you know, to empower them to be able to make this decision, even at the point in their life where they're probably not feeling very empowered, um, is kind of an interesting tension that you're always dealing with. So I guess with that, I wanted to just open it up for some questions. We have a microphone, so feel free to raise your hand and we will come to you. I have a question about the interim care um, and, and this model um, of women who, whose child is in interim care, how many of those women end up choosing to place long term and how many of those women choose to parent? Do we know the percentage or is there, um, you talked about some of the differences between those two groups, but uh, are, is it roughly equal? So it's, uh, I think it's hard to, for us to say based on our, our sample because of the way it was drawn. Uh, so for example, for that non-placement group, um, everyone in the non-placement group actually had participated in um, interim care. Um, so I, I couldn't necessarily give you uh, kind of a percentage. I'd actually defer to Kate if she has a sense of that uh, based on the, yeah. the other information they collect. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think that six, uh, we, in looking at our data holistically and, and you know, not something that was pulled from this particular research, about 65% of women um, who are using interim care choose to parent, and about 35 to 40 um, choose um, placement, which again goes to the importance of interim care because of that, of that buffer that's created for women to really take their time and understand what it's like to be apart from their child, to be thinking about their options, and at the same time visiting with their child and still being involved in, in the process. So there's no relinquishment of parental rights. There is a uh, temporary physical custody agreement, um, and I think it gives them the space and the time to really come to a decision um, that we see that they're satisfied with years later. And you're also using that time to sort of help them find supports if they do choose to parent. Absolutely. So we, we look for, you know, appropriate things that we can help put in place, you know, whether it's permanent housing, um, you know, working with um, any kind of therapist that will continue to treat, for example, uh, an untreated mental health uh, illness, you know, working with other family members to create a solid support network for the birth mother. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Go ahead. Uh, you, you mentioned the um, this interim period and the, um, well, it could be very disturbing for the adoptive parents to get attached to the child and lose it. What is your experience there? So perhaps I can clarify, the interim care providers are volunteers that are not adoptive parents. They are um, screened, um, we conduct thorough background checks, they are trained exclusively to provide this temporary respite. And so it's not them that are adopting, and you're right, it would be very traumatic for a child to be removed from an adoptive family situation. Over there. I apologize if this is redundant because I came in late. Um, but do you know relative outcomes for children who are placed in interim care versus those who go straight to adoption versus those who are just single, presumably single parented? Um, Initially, like how how far back do we have data for how children respond emotionally, developmentally? Okay, Kate's Kate. looks, Kate's thinking about it, but but from yeah. the data that we have, we have very limited data on the uh, on the children or the child outcomes, and that's one of the 
yet another one of the big methodological challenges. A lot of studies that have been done on adoption really focus on the, the adoption, the adopted children and the adoptive parents, not on birth mothers. And so this was approaching from a different angle. And so we didn't have that access to that data, but that's a, a great question um, because it's in that category of like, if you were to design something differently, how would you design it to capture that information exactly? I mean, I loved your questions because they're the same questions I had like, okay, so let's extend this further and get not only data on fathers, but also on the children and, and of these different scenarios if you go this way or if you go that way. Absolutely. Great question. I, I can speak about the experience comparing, um, <laughs> you know, um, our, looking at our disruption and dissolution rates and tying that to the uh, outcomes for children. So in, in using interim care or as the, as the element of our core element of our model, uh, our disruption and dissolution rates are at zero. I know that other adoption agencies who are not using interim care and that they conduct direct placements where a child born goes directly to the home of the adoptive family without this interim their service, their disruption and dissolution rates are higher. So I, I don't know if that answers your questions full, question fully. And I think the last part of your question was thinking about the single parents and what are the outcomes for children who are um, being parented. And unfortunately, that's not some data that we collect um, because it really is our, we intend to follow up with birth parents no matter what uh, outcomes they choose, but I think it's it's a it's a it's hard to do so when they don't want to be in touch in that way. Mm -hmm. So I think we're limited in what we collect from that perspective. But you did at one point, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but reduce the 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 length of interim care that was available. Is that is that right? Is it it used to be a little bit longer? Uh, I think it depends. Typically, it's about thirty days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes it goes to 60, it depends uh, on the needs of a child and uh, on the wishes of a birth parent. So um, it, it really uh, varies from one birth parent to another, but on average, it's about 30 days. Okay, great. Other questions? Go ahead. Hi, I, I see that you've collected a lot of data and done a lot of work. Can you help me and maybe each of the panelists and just distill for me what you judge to be the most important finding from this study? Sure. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of go first. I mean, I think, you know, from my perspective, I think a lot of the um, kind of narrative out there about adoption um, is based on, I think, what seemed to me, at least from this study, to be um, somewhat outdated understandings of what adoption looks like. Um, that it is, you know, very young women, who have been sort of coerced into this, um, you know, kind of uh, very poor, very uneducated. I mean, Brandon mentioned that, you know, uh, obviously the, the majority don't have bachelor's degree, but I think the majority do have high school degrees, uh, and, and a lot of them have some college, too. Um, and it's not surprising that not a lot of them are enrolled in school because their average age is 27, and not a lot of 27-year-olds are necessarily enrolled in school. Um, also, that it was a predominantly white population. I mean, again, you know, this is a small sample. This isn't, you know, one agency. This is a, you know, um, uh, you know, one state um, that that we're looking at here. Um, but I think it's worth kind of understanding, you know, who are the birth mothers today, um, and you know, not being kind of influenced by questions of what they necessarily look like in, in 1950. So I think. Just even the basic demographic information that we have on the Spence Chapin birth mothers from this study um, gives us a kind of different picture that we will want to compare to kind of the narratives that we're hearing out there in, in the media. So you stole my thunder. Oh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> because I, I would have, uh, you probably said it more eloquently than I would have, um, but the other one besides the, the demographic, the surprise of the demographic characteristics um, was the interim care component and the and the, um, the the glimpse or the window the promise of what the what that interim care um, service or mechanism might play in in that trajectory for the decision making so I think that was the other the other big one besides the surprising demographic characteristics 
Yeah, something I would add is, um, you know, build, building on what uh, you just said, Mike, is, is thinking about um, the satisfaction with this individual services, but also thinking about how they holistically come together um, to create a continuum that met the needs of birth mothers as they were going through this process, I think, uh, was really interesting to see. Uh, and then I think also the, the findings around life satisfaction. Uh, just in, in, in general, uh, in understanding uh, that uh, that experience, uh, I think was uh, was really valuable. Kate, okay. yeah, I, I you know I think there's been very little research that captures the experiences of birth parents. I think probably none at all. I know NCFA is engaged in a multi step research, but that's still pending. Adoption the National plan. Council for Adoption. Sorry. Yes, National Council for Adoption. Um, adoption planning is sensitive and private, and many birth parents are not comfortable with visiting these experiences. And the fact that they, um, in this research, stated that they, they wouldn't have changed their mind, that they, they are really comfortable and happy and with their decision. It's really about um, their voices uh, and experiences. Uh, which in turn can be critical to education and improving practices um, around adoption. Other questions? Uh, <clears throat> given how valuable the interim care service uh, seems to be, um, why is it so rare um, and why aren't, are, are there barriers um, that exist for other agencies to do this? Yes. Um, well, interim care um, is, is in fact a very rare offering and unique to Spence Chapin, um, something that um, was um, created many years ago and um, became part of our, our um, incorporation and our licensing. Um, you know, interim care can be described very similar to respite. Are there agencies that can't do respite? I, I think it depends on, um, you know, their their jurisdiction. I think it depends on whether or not they're doing public and private adoptions. So, um, but I think many agencies choose not to go that route um, and do direct placements instead. Um, so, to answer the question, interim care is a, is a rare service. It's a rare offering provided exclusively by Spence Chapin. Um, it is not something that we see with other service providers, with other agencies. And we should say the regulations here are just determined by the states. Um, and so you see a wide variety out there of different regulations for adoption agencies. And But even within New York State, um, uh, you know, it is there. There aren't any other agencies in New York uh, that, that do interim care. So even with, uh, taking account of the variety that's out there, um, this is a, a very small um, group that does this. So, Other questions? Right here. Um, in recent years, I've seen a lot of pushback against cross-racial adoption, interracial adoption, I think primarily in the international adoption context, but also in the domestic adoption context as well. I know, Brandon, you mentioned that the majority of your sample is white mothers. But I'm curious if there is anything in your data to suggest greater or lesser satisfaction, or how satisfaction levels in the adoption process differ between mothers who may place their children into same race adoption versus a interracial adoption. You know, you know I would say, Mike, uh, to jump in, but it's not an issue we explored uh, necessarily in this study. I, I don't recall any findings that would give us any insight uh, into that. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think that the sample, because that would have come from the survey. Yeah. I don't think the sample was large enough. And in the interviews, as as Brandon had pointed out, there was some. Um, there was, you know, there was some findings around the um, satisfaction with the responsiveness of Spence statement to the consideration for um, different characteristics, but not in the same way of, not exactly the same way that you're asking in terms of like, mm -hmm. do I want a match, a, a racially ethnic. Um, a match with the parents. It's more the flexibility of a spend shape and, and considering the various um, various options. Mm. Uh, Kate, I'm curious, like what what? How much of that is a consideration in your experience? Obviously, not on the survey level. Um, when when birth mothers are deciding <coughs> where to place their children, uh, I think it it varies. You know, I think that 
that that's the part about the choosing and and the matching that's really critical and a big element as Chapin. Um, birth moms come in really sometimes knowing exactly what they want uh, and sometimes really wanting to explore their options and looking at families and saying, you know, I, I really, you know, I, I believe in the in the best interest of my child. I really want to have this kind of family composition <clears throat> raise the child, to have um, that kind of background or that kind of religious affiliation. And so we profile families for birth parents uh, or birth mothers that of their choosing. Um, and so um, I think it's a case by case, um, base, it's on a case by case basis. And we should say that there are many more families that want to adopt than you have birth mothers who are placing. Um, so there are, you know, to borrow a phrase, binders full of families um, that these, uh, these women can choose from um, in order to make that decision. Are there other questions? Okay, great. Um, so we are actually gonna reconvene uh, in about five minutes or so if you wanna grab some coffee. Um, we're gonna have a panel where we sort of discuss more of the 30,000 foot view of kind of the cultural and political implications of this. So I hope you will come back for that. But grab some coffee and uh, please join me in thanking our panelists today. Thanks so much for doing the survey and for participating. Thank you. Uh, AEI is releasing a new study by the National Opinion Research Center on the demographics and experiences of birth mothers who place their children for adoption through Spence Chapin Services to Families and Children. Um, you can find the study that's now up on AEI's website. Um, I'm Naomi Schaefer Riley. I'm a senior fellow here at AEI. Um, now that we have in our first panel, which by the way, you can go back and watch, it'll be on our events page. Uh, we, in our first panel, got into kind of some of the details of the study, some of the findings. Um, I'm happy to bring in two more panelists to talk about uh, some of the cultural and political implications of this study and talking about adoption more generally. Um, Tim Carney is actually a senior fellow here at, as well at AEI. Um, he's also the senior political columnist at the Washington Examiner. Um, Emily Yaffe is an associate editor at the Free Press and has written for The Atlantic, The New York Times, and Slate, uh, where we, she was the original uh, Dear Prudence advice columnist. You were only the third. Oh my goodness. Okay, she was the third. And I only bring this up because a lot of the, the questions that you got sometimes were about adoption, as oh, I recall. Yeah, this was a, so, an so anyway, you're basically an expert. Um, oh. <laughs> um, but at the end of this conversation, we're going to set aside 15 minutes for questions too. So, um, so Emily and Tim, I kind of wanted to start off with, you know, sort of the current view, the kind of 30,000 foot view of adoption. Um, on the one hand, the public perception of adoption seems quite positive. Um, according to one YouGov poll, about half of Americans uh, say they have a favorable view of adoption compared to only 11% who have an unfavorable one. Um, and yet, I, I think it's pretty hard to open a newspaper or magazine or go online these days without getting some sense that adoption is definitely problematic um, and probably exploitative. Um, so I kind of wanted to find out what's going on here. Um, so let's start with you, Emily, kind of like how, how would you diagnose this? How have we kind of gotten to this point? Uh, when you invited me on this panel, it brought up a memory from many years ago of a 30 years ago a professor I knew who somehow it came up. She was an adoptive mother. So this woman would be in her late 90s now and her adopted child, you know, that much younger. But she told the story of an era that I think doesn't really exist in this country, at least anymore. And she said her adoption experience was very traumatic. And she described it, the birth mother was a young single woman, I guess in their early 60s. And it was just like, you are not bringing this baby home. It's not going to happen. So she agreed to place the child for adoption. And when this professor and her husband arrived at the hospital to pick up the baby. She said the nurses had to wrestle the baby from the mother, and they were in the hallway, and she was screaming, I'm not going to Don't take away my baby. Don't take away my baby. They did, and she described walking down the hallway with the baby, hearing these cries from the mother. And I was not a mother at the time, but I thought, oh my god, this poor young woman, which anyone would, and the Professor said, of course I felt sorry for her, but think about the trauma. To, it was, so, think about walking away with your baby and hearing that. So for her, it was also an extremely traumatic beginning of the, their life together. 
So to read about in this report about this interim care, that how the total revolution in what it means to place a child, I thought um, was so important. And I don't know about, you know, you a lot of the horror stories you hear are in foreign countries where women are paid or misled um, to give up a child, but it, this model seemed so powerful to me and the satisfaction from the mothers of having someone on their side in a lot of ways. You know, when they talked about, did your parents know? Does the father of the child know? Uh, a lot of these women who came into Spence Chapin, it sounds like they didn't really have supportive families and, and the social worker who was just working for them not didn't have conflict of interest. Having that relationship seemed so crucial and that seemed like something that should be scaled up. Mm -hmm. But I, we'll, we'll get more into it. I wanted to bring up just one other current perspective. So I was, I've known some women who've placed their child. I know a lot more adoptive parents and I was talking to friends who are adoptive parents, domestic adoption, uh, open adoption, and I was describing this interim care thing and this mother kind of bridled and she said, that's why we went to uh, an adoption agency in a state where the mother is 48 hours. Okay. Because it's very common for adoptive parents to be selective and develop a relationship with the birth mother as the uh, due date comes and then it doesn't happen. And she said that it happened to us and I didn't want it to happen again. So that's a flip side mm -hmm. um, to the, the model that is seeking to give the best uh, and most supportive care to the birth mother. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Tim, uh, you know, so is, is it just that our understanding of what adoption, domestic adoption looks like is out of date? Um, or are there kind of other cultural forces that are sort of, um, you know, pushing us to view adoption more skeptically in a general sense? Yeah, I would say it's adoption has become a typical culture war football in three ways. Um, the first is that I think some people on the cultural left are still think they're fighting the battles of the baby boomer generation. I know lots of baby boom women who went through adoption, birth mothers, who just, they basically had to hide while they were pregnant. They had no choice. They were told by every authority figure they had to give up the child. There was, so there wasn't any process of reasoning towards why they should uh, put the child up for adoption. And then the, you know, afterwards, uh, there was no counseling, no emotion or anything. So some people think that that's the image of adoption in the United States, and that's what every adoption is like. And so that's part of the reason it's a football. Two, I think a lot of the people, well, it's become about abortion. And you'll see the stories against adoption, just MSNBC, I think, has a policy that every week since the Dobbs decision leaked, they have to run an anti-adoption story. I, I, um, some of the headlines I saw, well, there was a quote from a piece you wrote uh, shortly after the leak or after the decision, Naomi. Um, quote, I would rather get an abortion than have a brown child who ends up being adopted by white evangelicals. Um, and then some MSNBC headlines, quote, stop ignoring the danger and heartbreak of birth mothers and all babies who give birth. Again, this was in response to the Dobbs leak. Uh, MSNBC contributor, quote, the whole notion that you know women should have children and just let the kids be adopted, well, that's not always a safe thing, particularly for black and brown kids. Another MSNBC headline, quote, adoption is trauma. And each of these sayings are the, the truth of the, the difficulty of these situations, of, of the questions at them, but the, it looks to me like there's a drumbeat being started up because, and this is the third way it's like a, a culture war football, some conservatives just think it's simple. Adoption, you don't need an abortion, adoption, it's that simple. Yes, they're factually right that that's the proper choice if you're not in a position to raise a child, but to think that it's simple and easy is really selling short everybody who goes through the experience, the birth mother, the adoptive parents, 
the birth father, as, as your study points out, and especially um, the children. So the basic answer is the reason it's becoming a football is because Roe v. Wade was overturned. One of the things that's come up in other adoption research, and we didn't get into this that much in the last panel, is that most women are not choosing between abortion and adoption. They're really choosing, and this is why I think the study is really important, because we're looking at women making the decision about whether to adopt, place for adoption, or parent. Um, and, and there are sort of two reasons for that. I mean, some, some women have just you know, decided that they don't, you know, abortion is not an option for them. Um, and a lot of the women you know, who, who come to adoption agencies are coming there because the deadline in their state um, for abortion has already passed. Um, so you know, what, what do you think? I mean, I guess one question that keeps coming up is, um, I don't know whether which one of you wants to try answering this is you know given changing uh, laws on abortion do we think that is going to actually affect the number of unwanted babies in particular states like if we sort of let um, you know if if we change these restrictions such that fewer women will will be able to access abortion let's say well into their pregnancy like you know I think this is one thing that we discussed with Spence Chapin is the number of women who are kind of in denial about whether they're pregnant you know um, you know they say they don't know but they probably do know um, you know what do we expect um, the changing kind of state legislation to do to this population? I don't expect, I mean, I'm a pro-lifer. I hope as many babies as possible are saved. I don't expect there will be a statistically large, significant increase in the um, in births like this for a variety of reasons. One, you know, Roe being overturned doesn't do any, it, it's, we've actually had more liberalized abortion laws in the more liberal states, right? Maryland has, has moved to make it easier and more subsidized, California similarly. And th so there's going to be cross-state um, abortions. And so, and also just there are exceptions and in most of even the, the states with more pro-life laws, something like 15 weeks or 12 weeks is gonna be the line and that affects less than 5% of all abortions if you're at 15 weeks. And so for those reasons, I think there will be some women who will go to full term because of these, but I don't think it will be a, on a nationwide level a statistically significant thing. If some of the six-week bans stay up, then on a local statewide level you could get it, but I don't think that nationally you will. Mm -hmm. I We don't know yet. Yeah. Um, and. As you say, the laws are all over the place. In more liberal states, it uh, hasn't changed. But if you have uh, six weeks, many women are, you know, especially if your life is kind of chaotic, may not know. And when they find out or start thinking about what they want to do, the deadline has passed unless they're going to go uh, to another state. So I th think it is perfectly possible we see a lot more women who then I can't get to another state, I have two children, I can't leave them, so the pregnancy proceeds almost, you know, without making a, a choice, the choice is made. I do, I did know a case of, um, you know, how did you not know you were pregnant? Uh, a young woman who was probably six and a half, seven months pregnant when um, her, boyfriend's mother, they were at a party, <laughs> I was at the, she, and the mother came around to all of us and said, um, go look at Caroline, is she pregnant? And suddenly, you know, it was like, how, yeah, quite pregnant. Um, and she turned out to be pregnant, and she said, oh, okay, well, I'm gonna get an abortion. It's like, it is way too, too late. And the, you know, how did you not know? Well, I thought I was having cramps. I thought, so the, in your report, there were two women who found out they were pregnant when they arrived in the emergency room giving birth. So the ability, the denial is a huge thing. And I, I think we may see more cases of, of women who've just lives are too difficult for them to have made the kind of decision that a lot of uh, women who come to Spence Chapin and want to discuss their options are making. 
Um, I wanted to kind of get in, in some of your impressions from the report a little bit too. Um, as you said, you know these these you know our our view of of adoption uh, looks you know kind of popular. On the one hand, like this is what kind of I keep coming back to. On the one hand, you know Americans generally do have a favorable view of adoption, and I wonder whether it's just that they have a favorable view of the people who do it who adopt, um, and not necessarily the whole process. Um, but but leaving that aside. Um, were you surprised by you know the the demographics of who were these birth mothers? Um, you know, someone who is in their late twenties, you know, um, is is that someone that you typically think of as being a birth mother? Um, you know, and the fact that they you know they they sometimes have other children. Um, the fact that they had you know it was you know certain minimal levels of education that they were predominantly white. I mean, you know, Tim, you brought up some of the the racial kind of conversation that's going on now. Um, what, what, if anything, surprised you about the demographics of this group? Exactly what you say, the idea of the teen mother who has to slink away from high school and um, give birth somewhere and come back and not say anything. Th these were, many were mature uh, women who the decision was, I already have two children and I'm barely hanging on. So that was surprising. But you know what? It's also surprising when you see the demographics of who gets abortion. It's off, off you know, it's the same group. It's not a 16-year-old who didn't, you know, want to think about getting birth control. It's the same um, kind of uh, population. I was also struck um, that the study found overall um, that the women who chose to um, keep their child versus the women who chose to place their child in general, the women who placed had more education, um, better careers or were making more money or more personal ambition were a slight bit older. So I thought that was an interesting um, difference that I didn't expect. That was, that was, last one was the most interesting difference to me is um, that again, the, the, the other way of putting it is that the, um, almost all of the women who both uh, decided to be a parent and uh, decided to put up the child were unmarried. It was like 85%. So among these unmarried women, the ones who were most likely to say, I want to raise this child myself, sorry, um, the ones who were most likely to do that were less educated, younger. Um, and lower income. And so the, <clears throat> the implication there, and I, so this is related to a lot of the study that I've, I've done. Um, well, first of all, these are, very, these are small sample sizes that we're dealing with. So something we should talk about is how this needs to be studied to get better, better policy on federal, state, and local levels. Um, uh, but a lot of the research I've done about People need meaning in life. And for a lot of teen pregnancies, one of the surprising things is that um, we see, oh, your life is getting derailed. And maybe in the long run, this is going to end up looking like something that threw a, a young woman or a young couple's life off some trajectory. But at the time, it can feel like now I have something yeah. to live for. For a lot of moms, there was one that study. That's not unintended. I mean, you know, a lot yeah. of the times, you know, <coughs> neither intended nor. Right. Yeah, there's a gray area on that. There was one study I remember, and I got to look this up again. But it was an effort to dissuade high school girls from getting pregnant by giving them a little baby doll to take care of, and it would cry, and you'd have to feed it. It was like a little robot baby, and um, it didn't deflate the, the women's desire to have kids as much as they thought it was, because now they had something really important to do, more important than studying chemistry or, or, or you know, pre-calc or whatever. And so that is part of it. The other part of it is the sort of American dream, ambition, self-starter thing. Every family, to some extent, is like a startup business in some way, because you're just doing it on your own, right? It's more like a small business than it is like belonging to a big company. 
I've read a lot of research showing that that desire, I want to run my own business, or these days, like I'm going to write my own app and I'm going to sell it and I'm going to do a side hustle that's going to make me independent. That attitude is more prevalent in working class, in people raised by a single mom, in people who, um, with less education in America. So it's sort of almost like this, you can do it on your own, go out, you don't need any institutional support mindset is that kind of sounds like part of the American dream. That's more prevalent in the working class where it's you know, in some ways a lifesaver and in some ways can lead to people you know, falling for pyramid schemes, et cetera, in the economic realm. So that idea, you know what? No, I am going to beat the odds as a 17-year-old mom and I'm going to raise this child. And then you look at the stories where that worked and that it really, that, that inspirational story, however long the odds might seem, that will resonate more in the working class, is, is my assumption. But again, I'd love to see. But it's much interesting more data that that, I mean, that actually, I think, is part of the confluence of things that have actually made adoption less popular in recent years, which is you have sort of two forces now in American society. You have kind of uh, on the, you know, who, for, for women who have, you know, pregnancies that are either unintended or unwanted, that, you know, on the one hand, they're hearing, you know, abortion is the answer for you. But on the other hand, they're not necessarily hearing adoption is the answer. They're hearing the, you can do it. And even a lot of the, you know, crisis pregnancy centers, you know, some of the messages really no, you know, we will provide you with a lot of support. We'll, you know, find you better housing. We'll, you know, we'll do these things, but, you know, you can do it. Um, and I think, you know, look, even it, Spence Chapin is providing all of these options to women, which I think is great. Um, but, on, but, you know, a lot of the women are hearing this message that, you know, you can, this, this will provide you with this meaning. This is, you know, a, a kind of case of self-sufficiency for you. And so it's hard to sort of figure out who the group is that would be there saying, like, maybe adoption, you know, like maybe you should consider it. Because it, it almost feels like something you have to whisper as an option because it's not being embraced by either side right now. I, I was, uh, dear, became Dear Prudence um, in around 2005 and ended around uh, 2015. When I started, <laughs> I would answer many letters about, um, well, I'm pregnant. I really don't like my boyfriend. So, you know, he says we should get married, but why should I get married? I'm going to have the baby. And I would talk about the importance of, if you're going, you know, getting married, of creating a stable home um, and cite the studies showing how important that was. I would get overwhelming letters uh, you are a troglodyte, go back to the Cretaceous era. Uh, all, what children need is love. So mothers are going to love their children. That's all they need. And um, I finally at some point gave up on the marriage thing because that, you know, no one was listening anymore. And I think that's kind of we're not being honest with people about what it takes to raise a child because you're, you know, and, and a lot of people said children want their parents to be happy. So, you know, if the mother just wants to raise her child alone and she's happy, and, you know, like children are really conservative. I don't think they care that much about their parents' happiness. <laughs> they, uh, you know, they want stability. But yes, I think. In a way, that message can translate to an anti-adoption message because you're a nice person, you will love your child, and that's essentially all that's needed. And on some levels, that's a very, you could use the word individualistic, but it's kind of the wrong word. But it is related to the same idea of autonomy that I think is starting to become almost a, a, a dogma in a new faith. of let's just And it, it ignores the roles that institutions play in the lives of, you know, People who, um, uh, most successful people, they depend on institutions. They and so I guess this would be a, a question for, um, uh, I don't know what, what Spence Chapin does or other adoption agencies. People I know who are having success on marriage counseling, for instance, on preventing divorces and that kind of thing. What they're doing is they're plugging married couples in with their own little platoons. 
and not being like, you have to come to church, but if they go to church, be like, we're going to make a small group of other young parents and slightly older parents and plug you in. If you go to, if you, you know, whatever community institution they do, not just a place that cuts you a check, but that gives you a circle and brings you together, not just with people, social workers who can help you, but with like buddies and friends and neighbors. And that that is what I would think if somebody said, you know, what do um, both these birth parents who uh, are going to raise a child, the birth parents who have to, who feel it's best to give the child up for adoption and the, um, and the adoptive parents, what are they going to need? How can we help them? Plug them in, make sure they have a human support system. That's honestly the main thing that all of us depend on for success is, you know, the people who bring you the frozen casseroles and, and everything else. So I guess that would be a question I have for Spence Shape and other adoption agencies. To what extent are we plugging mothers, parents, families into other little platoons of um, human level support systems. Yeah, so uh, we have, so Kate Trumbelskaya, who is the CEO of Spence Chapin, was on the last panel and I sort of asked her to stick around. So I wanted to, you know, have, have Kate answer that question like, you know, how much are you doing in terms of trying to provide those social supports or, or, or connect the birth mothers and maybe even the mothers who choose to parent in with those social supports? And, you know, Spence Chapin is, not a religious agency, but a lot of the adoption agencies around the country are religious, and so maybe it's sometimes a little bit easier for those groups to sort of help you find that group through a faith connection. But, but Kate, can you can talk a little bit about what it would mean, you know, when, when you're sort of trying to give these parents a sense of, you know, what supports are available? What does that look like? Sure. And I, I think the supports are available for both birth parents and adoptive parents, um, you know, on, on a continuum. Um, and they look like a community support uh, for adoptive parents. Um, um, and they look like community support in a sense of providing your traditional therapy um, to mentorship programs for kids who are of a certain age to um, other programs that really gauge or focus on a specific age group or demographic, um, the same kind of services, similar services are, are available for birth parents. Uh, it's around building community, having birth parent support groups, um, having celebrations and gatherings for birth parents exclusively. Now, um, we do see more adoptive families joining the community, building their own communities, and participating in a lot of these community engagements and events, and less so with the birth parents. Um, and that's, that's a really difficult um, um, group to engage in terms of building a community. Um, though we see from this research, one of, the, um, one of the main feedbacks in the survey was around a desire to have a community uh, for birth parents to be part of. Um, and so it, it's this, it's this tension between, I, I want to be part of this community. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure if I'm comfortable going back to the same space where I had this experience. So it's figuring out, is there another way to create a community space for birth parents who are able, um, to feel comfortable and, and to be part of that. Um, well, I was thinking about the, the question of um, the open adoptions and these adoption agreements. Um, I was wondering, like, how, you know, how that struck both of you. I mean, on the one hand, it feels this very legalistic thing, and, you know, um, you know no parent knows, you know, how they're going to feel about having that continued contact um, with a birth parent, you know, five years, ten years down the line, just the same way we have no idea what it's going to be like, you know, to raise children. Um, you know, do you, what do you think about when Kate was describing the last panel, sort of the rise in these legally enforceable agreements, um, do you think that's kind of a, a positive direction, um, you know, for this uh, kind of area to be going in? What, what were your impressions of the adoption agreements? Um, I, I was struck that Kate mentioned that New York has moved to these enforceable agreements because one of the things that, that came out of the survey is that the looseness of it actually worked 
quite well. You know, there was an understanding there would be connection. But again, having known many adoptive families, it sometimes starts with a lot of contact, constant photo, just the way you're not taking photos of your 15-year-old the way you are of your five-month-old. Um, you know, photos, letters. And that it often kind of drifts off. Um, and I think a system that allows both parties to kind of feel their way, and obviously it's not 100% of the time going to, um, both parties are not going to be happy about that, but it seems like at, to start at the beginning, this is what you will do for the next 18 years seems unrealistic. And also then you're having, it, it doesn't take into account where the child is because Again, when you know uh, adoptive parents, that often the child reaches a certain age, I want to know my birth parents, I want more contact. Or I've also known families with, you know, in open adoptions and the kids, like I, especially in teenage years, I don't want this now, it's, it's too much. So it seems like what the survey said, that the looseness of it is much better. I want to throw in one other thing. Um, I think one, one of the reasons a lot of people turn to foreign adoption, and I've heard this articulated, is I don't want the parents showing up. I'm going to be a parent, and I know what that entails. And in 10 years from now, I don't want bio, biological parents coming and saying, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I really want to be intensely in this. Uh, child's life and a lot of uh, foreign adoptions, you know, there isn't going to be any continued contact. Right, right. Tim? Yeah, that, that was my impression as well, is that you would want some sort of certainty that, I mean, it, I think the impressions I'd gotten was not so much that they didn't want contact with the birth parents, is that they were worried that the birth mother at some point would just reverse her decision at three years old and say, well, now that I'm married or now that I realize, you know, I finished high school or whatever, or I realize I made a mistake, I'm going to... And so that total uncertainty about a reversal, a change of mind by the birth mother was the fear, not so much that contact itself would be a negative. And so that, I mean, that, I guess, would be another thing that sort of good, broad research on this can do, since we're having almost experiments in different states doing different things, whether it's enforceable agreements or more open adoption, a, a real thorough collection of data on experiences and, and moods could really um, point us, it could be a, a, a laboratory of democracy sort of thing, point us towards the different experiences that different situations different parents have. I guess, Kate, I want to, maybe you can shed a little bit of light on this. You know, um, there there definitely is this fear in the back of the minds of adoptive parents that you know someone is going to change their mind. And you know, you mentioned earlier, like that's why I did the you know went to a state where there was a you know they only had forty eight hours to change their mind. Or you know, but but what um, you know, how frequently does that happen? And do do we need to think about laws and policies um, that fix that part of this, or is that kind of a, a myth from a long time ago? Yeah, I think I, I want to first also address the question about the PACAs. Um, I, you know, there is this the um, legally enforceable agreement. The legally enforceable PACAs, in particular, lawyers are very creative in drafting these agreements. So there's always the uh, inclusive in these agreements are the the wishes of the child at a certain age. If there are no, uh, you know, if a birth parent or adoptive parents. Uh, meet, miss a meeting or birth parent misses a meeting, for example, consecutively two times, uh, meetings are without a valid excuse, uh, that portion of the agreement is null and void. So there are different ways that these agreements are tailored to each, each individual situation. Um, you know, and the attorney for the adoptive parent and the attorney for the birth parent really come together to identify some of these terms and to really think about that. Um, in terms of the revocation um, that you're mentioning with birth parents who are changing their mind, New York agency revocation period is 30 days. So birth parents have 30 days to re um, you know, revoke their surrender instrument upon signing. And what we do really is um, 
this is another key component of interim care. While the child is interim care, if the birth parent is ready to sign the surrender, let's say mid mid uh, interim care state at 15 days, the remaining 15 days or so, the child remains in interim care for those reasons exactly, not to create trauma for the adoptive families and really give the birth parent an opportunity. Um, in my years of being at Spence Chapin for over uh, a decade of uh, 12 years, I've seen one revocation um, that wound up in court, actually, where a best interest hearing was held to determine whether it's or not it's in the best interest of the child to return um, to the birth mother. And the court ruled in favor of the adoptive family. Uh, that is not to say that it um, happens differently. Uh, but it really is something that we are focused on because and the interim care period really helps to keep this revocation period um, at a certain point where birth parents are not always, uh, you know, revoking a surrender instrument, which which places a, a very different legal spin on the situation than if they are just choosing to have their child return to them from interim care. So that's really the difference. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to sort of ask, you know, Tim, you mentioned early on that, you know, the, the, you're in your third kind of this, why this is a culture war issue, um, that, you know, folks who, uh, you know, don't want people to abort um, view adoption as kind of this easy solution for them. Um, are there policies that you think that we should be putting in place? Um, and and you know, a lot of people immediately afterwards, you know, on the Hill, were like, "Well, you know, maybe maybe we should do something different to make adoption more a more viable option." Um, are there are there policies or just kind of changes in our cultural attitudes that you think we need to see in order to you know stop the kind of whisper of adoption and say, "No, this is actually something legitimate that you might want to think about." Well, so first, what I learned from listening to your first panel about the Title IV-E policy that we have, this federal infrastructure that's supposed to help foster parents and ends up discouraging adoption, in effect. That sounds like a great place to start, is to figure out if that can be fixed. Um, but also culturally, I think there's already a shift. I still remember during the Republican convention in 2008, right beforehand, Sarah Palin gets announced as a running mate. And then it comes out that she has a teenage daughter who is uh, pregnant and unmarried. And my boss was Bob Novak at the time. And so he was at CNN and he calls me and says, Tim, all the liberals here say that the Christian conservatives are going to disown Sarah Palin because her, her daughter is pregnant out of wedlock. And I literally laughed out loud. And he was like, I didn't think that was true, but you know, you know, it was like uh, Mark Shields and uh, I forget who the others were. And I just think there's a, a generational shift from when, um, from again, when Mark Shields was a kid <laughs> um, to now about, okay, this happens. And so among conservative Christians who understand that this happens and that the pregnant 18-year-olds, 17-year-olds are not being whisked away to somewhere in rural Wisconsin to hide for eight months, um, that, yeah, you know, it's a suboptimal situation that everybody uh, knows somebody who ended up in, and that, um, so the, the stigma of that being reduced doesn't mean a wholesale acceptance of just anything goes sexually, but also, as you suggest, have you have suggested today and in other things you've written, there's um, why did that go hand in hand with the idea, okay, so 17 year old girls are all perfectly capable of raising children or that, in other words, that somehow reducing stigma on adoption didn't seem to happen hand in hand with reducing stigma on a teenage pregnancy or something. Mm. So that's kind of the cultural puzzle I'm, I'm popping around in my, in my head. That I'm stating as a puzzle because I don't know how to address it. I think the foster care component is really important because as the, the, you write, Naomi, about 100,000 adoptions take place in the US a year. I don't know if that's just domestic but ha you wrote half of those are what we're talking about here, and half are from the foster care system. And you're an expert on the foster care system, and that's 
you know, I read your fascinating book on this, that's so much more fraught and difficult when you have the government involved and the government is essentially saying family unification above all. And what happens a lot with those kids is they're the parents who are never really going to be able to parent, um, their parental rights are not severed. So the kid ends up just floating through life, moving from foster care setting to foster care setting, a child who might have been able to be adopted at a younger age and have a stable home. On the other hand, you don't want to sever rights if um, the parent could parent. So that's a whole other aspect of where um, ad adoptive kids come from. I do want to add one thing when I was talking about encouraging people to get married. I would never encourage a bad, disastrous, dangerous marriage. But it, you know, it was letters from, well, we've been together for two years, and I'm going to have the baby, but I, I, don't, I don't really want to marry this guy. And it's like, he's going to be in your life for the rest of your life. So yeah. anyway. Well, on that front, I do think we, um, we have pendulum swings, and there's certain times that we're just we're like not allowed to talk about um, way costs and benefits. And so when we say, okay, there's a, a cultural good that is a, you know, f because of uh, better education for women, more economic opportunities, other cultural changes, fewer women are getting um, trapped into abusive relationships where they're totally helpless. Obviously, there's millions of them, but there's less of them. But then on the other hand, you know, you, it is fewer women getting married, you know, the risk of, of ending up in a bad, disastrous relationship like that can lead to an overcorrection. And are we in a place where, um, where we should be saying, well, are we erring too much on the side of let's wait until we have that perfect marriage that you'll read about in places like the super marriages. They waited until they both had PhDs and they were 38 before they got married and they have the best marriage ever. Great, I'm very happy for those two professors who did that, but not everybody's going to be that way. So as a culture, have we moved too much in the direction of saying, you have to make sure you have the absolute perfect guy. You could, I'm the kind of guy who thinks that people get married and then they learn how to live and live with and love one another better. And are we losing some of those because we're worried about the uh, abusive, horrible, disastrous situations Emily's referring to? A lot of the people who write to me, and I, I think surveys show this, you know, my parents got divorced. The one thing I'm not going to do in life is get divorced. It was so horrible. So you yeah. never get married. Uh, and and it's also a we see way to avoid divorce. <laughs> <laughs> we see the socioeconomic difference. The college educated people have a life script. You get educated, you start your career, you get married, then you have children. And non college educated people are not following that life script. You, you know what are we about forty percent um, out of wedlock births in this country. So yeah, there's been a big overcorrection to avoiding divorce. A majority of births to non-college educated women are out of outside of marriage. So uh, Kate, we sort of started to get at this a little bit in the last panel, this question of you know, uh, a woman who has kids who are already in the foster care system and, you know, whether it's because of a mental health issue or a substance abuse issue, it, it seems like it's going to be very hard for them to parent a child. Um, you mentioned that, you know, caseworkers don't are not educated about private adoption, which is they're, they're not, they're, they're rarely if ever going to say to a woman, you know, have you considered the option that instead of, you know, a few months from now, the state may have to remove your child, that you could actually like save yourself, this child, an enormous amount of trauma. You could pick the family that you want, you know, to be raising your child. Um, I, I go back and forth. It still feels quite coercive to have the government say that, and it will. It's hard to imagine that it won't come out as a threat to a woman who is in this situation. But on the other hand, it does feel like a much better outcome than yet another child who has to endure, you know, severe abuse and neglect before the state intervenes and removes that child. So, you know, where do you where do you come down on this, and what would 
What do you think adoption education would look like for um, you know, social workers or lawyers you know, who work for the, the government? Yeah, I, I think it's access to information. It's access to these options. The fact that adoption is not discussed when child protective investigations ensues is, 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 is unfair, simply unfair for the birth parents who have either never experienced foster care or have experienced it so many times, um, you know, and it's detrimental mostly to the child or the children who are, who become part of the system. So I, I think that the, the child protective specialists really have no choice. They're, they're not allowed simply to speak about private adoption as an option. So, you know, really, if you're focused so much on family preservation and reunification and your funding is entirely tied to how quickly you can get the child home. And the reality is you can't get that child home, uh, you know, for, for a few years at least. We know average amount of time is about 30 months for a child in New York before a permanency goal is achieved or, or even commands. So, um, that's that's traumatic to the child, but I, I think that thinking about private adoption in the context of even before commencing a child protective investigation, really working on, you know, we talk about this preventative model that's really the, the core of offering in child welfare today. Why not include private adoption in offering and speaking about um, what preventive services we can put in place before it becomes uh, a government intervention matter. And to your point, Naomi, where it feels slightly coercive. Um, and I think it's, you know, I, I think the child welfare system doesn't support um, adoption in this way because there's still, um, you know, that view that the children are better off with their biological families. And, and that's the the prominent view, let's focus on rehabilitating the family. I mean, when we go to court as attorneys, as a former attorney for ACS, you have to have a showing of reasonable efforts to prevent or eliminate the need for removal. Essentially, what that means is what services did you put in place and how successful were your services before you removed the child? And the reality is you can put as many services as you want in place if the birth parent or the um, the family is not willing to participate, there's only so much you can do. Mm -hmm. I was struck in the survey, it was a very small number, but a few of the women who come to Spence Chapin, um, who, it, it wasn't that they'd had, I don't think, children previously put into child protective services, but under this pregnancy, either because of criminal acts or, you know, substance abuse, something had become, come into the orbit of child protective services. And they um, said, I want to place my child for adoption because I don't want my child born into this government system where that's going to control my life and my child's life. So it was a small sample, but that I thought that was interesting. Yeah, definitely one of the, I think, biggest misconceptions and misunderstandings around adoption is what is the difference between private adoption and public adoption? Because you you do, there are these surveys that, you know, when, when women are asked about this, that, you know, private adoption, they'll say, oh, I don't want the government involved in this or something like, no, this is specifically not involving the government. This is this is letting you make these decisions, you know, as we've talked about here in in this, you know, in this way where you are getting to pick the birth family and you are getting to decide about post-adoption contact and things like that. Um, I want to open it up for questions in a minute, but just kind of a, a kind of a last question maybe for for the two of you. If you could think about kind of what, you know, how you see this developing over the next, you know, um, decade or so. I mean, you know, Tim, you mentioned this kind of the adoption is, you know, a, a football in the culture war. Um, there's a mixed metaphor. Maybe it's <laughs> supposed to be like a bomb in the culture. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, you know, do, do you see this dissipating or is adoption just doomed to kind of become another partisan issue? I mean, you have this broad support now, but, you know, 10 years from now, is this going to be, a, you know, half the country supports it and half the country doesn't? Um, or, or what other developments do you see happening on a kind of cultural and political level? Well, I'm the conservative. I'm sitting on the right, which means I'm pessimistic about the future. Um, I think it's getting worse. I think, I mean, just already the idea of like, oh, you get to 
place your child in the sort of family that you want. That's discrimination. I mean, a Jewish mother who wants a Jewish family to raise her kids is guilty of racial discrimination. Um, if I, you know, a, a Christian place that said you have to be a married heterosexual couple, if, if MSNBC found out that these things exist, they would be like, how does this exist in the, in the year 2023? Let's, so there's a million different ways in which is, and just like every Republican politician who says, well, it's simple, you just put the baby up for adoption, that triggers uh, a backlash against it by the, uh, a lot of the, the pro-choice crowd. So I see, it, um, I see a lot of reasons why adoption will become more fraught in the future. I'm not a conservative, and I agree with you that anything <laughs> that can give us a sense of doom will continue to give us a sense of doom, and that this um, is because of the abortion decision is because adoption is going to get much more caught up, um, and which is really unfortunate. It's and I, and the political bomb football will <laughs> um, be, become more a part of our discussion of adoption and who adopts and, you know, of how you force um, birth mothers to give up their children, et cetera. I, yes, I agree it will get worse. Okay, great. <laughs> um, all right, so <laughs> some questions from the audience. I'll take a crack at it. <clears throat> I'm Carl Pulzer, and I, I, first of all, I, this has been a fantastic discussion, very enlightening and uh, provoking. So I do a lot of work on inequality, economic inequality, and advocating for the people at the bottom. So in general, I see um, having kids in America is mainly a lower income activity. About 45% of the births are through Medicaid. And restraining the population is, you know, by the researchers that really look at this the best, like, Milanovic, that's how people get wealthier. Wealthy countries have, are not even replacing their populations. China, the US are two of them. Well, that being said, so how can we, how can we help um, financial incentives to, to get families to, to adopt to domestic kids? Medicaid could, I mean, I was just wondering, I was just looked up Maryland's policy online. <clears throat> they actually continue Medicaid coverage when you adopt a kid. Well, why don't we liberalize that so people with middle incomes can get some support for a couple of years and some, maybe some support finding these care, uh, community networks and some social support? <coughs> so, I mean, in the long run, Medicaid is going to save a lot of money because you're, you're directing a kid into a private sector kind of network as opposed to, you know, job-based uh, health care. So that's one thing you could do is provide more support for the families that adopt the kids. So just, I have another bunch of things, but that's for now just an idea. Carl, you'll be excited to know that I am writing a book on demographics and uh, the baby bust in the, in the U.S. and the West. And so first of all, um, sort of the Thomas Malthus idea that you get wealthier by having fewer kids. I don't think, if it held, it doesn't hold in the, in the 21st century. Um, the countries that are well below 2.1 babies per woman are... are falling in that direction, and it's harming their economies, et cetera. And so on an individual level, um, the birth rate is approximately the same. You know how everything in demographics, et cetera, is a U-curve? The only, you have to be like over $400,000 before you start having more than 1.7 babies in the U.S. So it's true that the bigger bump is on the other side of the U, um, which is uh, women without uh, husbands, often without a high school degree, who are above um, the, the, the cultural average on that. Um, I think there's a real interesting question. Uh, money to help people build out the size of their families. Europe tries this. Some states try this. Um, the upshot is, yes, you can. People who want bigger families, giving them money can help a little bit to help them get more families, but it's really, really expensive. Helping people at the time of birth uh, does probably more to prevent child poverty than it does to help people who want three kids get three kids. 
So then on adoption, I think that the, the key is just the, it seems like such a barrier, the cost of adopting is so big. And so the tax credits that we currently have for that are important where it's just like, boom, this is going to be thirty, fifty thousand dollars um, $50,000. And it's money that people don't like where it's going. When I spend money on my kids, it's, it's money's going to me. It's going to my children. If I spend money on lawyers, that doesn't feel like it's going. So that's where I think sort of the, um, the supports we have probably do drive up um, the number of people who are able to adopt. But, uh, and then as far as birth, there's a big discussion recently. I think you guys have seen it. Um, some conservatives saying, well, maybe we should make birth free. Other countries, some European countries do that. It shouldn't cost $20,000. That discussion is sort of brand new on, among conservatives in America. And it's interesting to see the, the back and forth. I'm following that because that's something, if we can do that and, and it work to make sure that birth itself is free, that can help on all sides of the decision making here. And that can be through a vehicle like Medicaid, uh, that no matter what, you get Medicaid coverage if you have a baby. There are reasons not to do that, just like there's reasons not to do any government intervention. But it's, it's worth having the debate. We should make a distinction here, again, between private and public adoption. So private adoption, there is you know, a, pay a payment that you know, money that the adoptive family is putting out. Public adoption is, uh, is free in this country. And we also provide a lot of incentives, adoption, subsidies uh, for families that do that. But, I, but Kate can probably get into this a little bit more if you're interested in kind of the structure of how this works. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, private adoptions are uh, paid for by the adoptive parents and they cover all of the services that the birth parents are provided with. And there's definitely um, a, a scale of fees that um, can be attached to different income. And that's what Spence Chapin does uh, in a lot of cases. If a family is not able to afford to pay the fee, there, there, there are ways that we can support the families. And a lot of agencies do do that. And uh, public adoptions, as you mentioned, uh, Naomi, um, through foster care, uh, families who are foster parents receive an ongoing stipend. When they do adopt, they're eligible for subsidies. Other questions? My, my question is for Kate. Kate, I'm wondering over the your 12 years at Spence uh, Chapin, if you've seen a change in the proportion of women who are pregnant who just do not want to raise the child. And then a follow-on is, do they now are more likely to choose an abortion than to give up the child for adoption? Um, so we do, most of the women that are referred to us and come to us, they mostly come in the third trimester. So it's really, as Naomi pointed out earlier, is really adoption versus parenting or uh, placement with another relative, foster care, or really other alternatives. Very rarely do we have cases where women come to us in a first trimester or in the beginning uh, where abortion is, is an option. Um, in terms of do we see more women coming to us not wanting to parent, we've seen an uptick since COVID um, where um, we've actually seen more uh, women coming with toddlers and older children who said that during COVID, um, they really were at a loss and couldn't find any help or support and um, really wanted our help to help find a family. They weren't ready to be parents. They didn't wish to parent. Um, so we've seen an, uh, an increase in those kinds of cases, uh, specifically re related to toddlers. And we work with women um, who have uh, chosen a family and we've found families who are able to adopt uh, older children. So that's, that's sort of the change that we've seen over the last, I would say, um, two years or so. Either one of you have a reaction to that? Wow. Wow. Um. It, it takes a village to raise a child, as a wise woman once put it. And the lockdowns, et cetera, deprived yeah. us of, of that. And so, yeah, it was, it was maddening to be <laughs> locked up with the yeah. kids for that long. And, uh, and so stripping people, people were permanently detached from communities um, because of the, the lockdowns. Yeah. Brian? I want to... Um, 
respond, I don't want to respond, I want to um, pick up on some of the pessimism that, that two of you mentioned regarding the, the future of adoption in the political or social space. Uh, my question is, what research, what data, or what policies do you think um, might diffuse the bomb or diffuse Naomi's football? Um, what, what would we need to, um, what would we need to not allow this to um, allow that apocalyptic future that you're envisioning? If the sort of generally uplifting findings of this study, which is a, a, a narrow, it's one city, one thing, if, if we could do that on a national level and A, find out that it's a more positive experience, private adoption is a more positive experience than people assume for the birth mothers, and then B, figure out specifically what's not working and doing this in Appalachia and doing it in Los Angeles and doing it in heavily immigrant populations and doing it in uh, rural, white, black, et cetera, um, I think we can move, because again, I think a lot of the culture wars, assuming that it's the same that it was for, you know, in, in 1972 and uh, people falsely assuming it's easy when it's not. And just, uh, I mean, I work at a, Public Policy Research Institute, so me saying we need more uh, research and studies done on this could be self-serving, but uh, I really think that that would be uh, the first step. The whole time I was reading the study, I was like, I would love to see what these numbers are on a much larger scale, but there's privacy stuff, there's family stuff. I don't know if that's possible. You might know better, Naomi. Well, Ryan actually is at the National Council for Adoption, so he would know <laughs> really well. Um, but, you know, maybe you can tell us a little bit. I don't know if you want to give Ryan back the microphone. I know you guys are working on, uh, you know, a sort of a, a similar study and maybe in a larger We study. don't have our, our analysis done yet, so I, I don't know what we're going to find. Uh, but we've, you know, surveyed a very large sample of birth parents, birth mothers, and birth fathers, and um, anxious to see what it says. And, and I think um, studies like the one that Spence Chapin did are um, a, a great example of, of what lots of agencies can do because they'll look at their community. I mean, it's not, it's not normal that it's, um, what Spence Chapin is seeing, a third of their clients were born out of this country. That reflects New York City. That mm -hmm. reflects New York more than it's going to be true across the nation. And so um, uh, allowing us to, to see these snapshots right. you know, from different agencies will be really useful. And so I commend them for their work on this. And, and I should say, you know, I, we talk generally about kind of public attitudes, but they vary considerably among different populations. I mean, in the African-American population, adoption is not held in as high a regard as it is among some other groups. So even if you're thinking about how to change, you know, public opinion or just, you know, individual women's attitudes about adoption, this is going to have to be something that's done on like a community by community basis. Um, and, it, it, you know, not just sort of like a kind of broad American, you know, how can we have as many, you know, PSA ads as, as possible. <laughs> other questions? All right, well, please join me in thanking our panel today. Thanks for coming. And Thank you. You can find the study on AEI's website and uh, you know, reach out with any questions. We're happy to, to answer and, and expand the research if we can. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks.